Good morning, church. Good morning. Hey, there we go. I know it's dreary outside, but if you're born again, it's always sunshine in your soul. Amen. 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 Someone said, ha ha. I don't know about y'all, but there are a couple people, like a, a select group of people that I look uh, at dur- in my life. And the thing that comes to mind when I think about them or talk about them is, man, that woman loves Jesus. Or, man, that dude loves Jesus. I don't mean to make a, uh, uh, two classes within the family of God of what it looks like to be a son or daughter of his. But the people that come to my mind, I don't know about y'all's, my mom. You know, my mom is not a biblical savant, but what she dearly has experienced is forgiveness. She looks at the good news of Jesus with regularity and that informs her worship. Next person I think of is my first Christian friend. His name was Richard, 75 years old when I first met him, around 80 when he passed. That was a man who finished life well. And it was because of his love for God. Now on the opposite end of the spectrum, that dude was a biblical savant. So you can't put people in boxes. The word that he learned really did inform his heart and make him desire to obey God. And then lastly, I think of the most busy person that I know of, my coach from UNL, Coach Brown. That guy takes any speaking opportunity His ministry is to evangelize and prophesy over the whole state, the good news of Jesus. And yet that guy will not allow a day to go by without connecting with Jesus. That guy loves God. And from all three of those people, and I know that you could recall people in your mind who fit that description of, oh, they just love Jesus. There's something unique about each one of them that's commonly shared. And it has to do with today's text. It's that they love God for what he's forgiven them of, saved them from, and called them to. They have this ultra awareness of their depravity and how God, when he saved them, ended up withholding how far they could have went. They are hyper aware of their lives, of where they gave in immorally. And then they experience the forgiveness of Jesus. You know, those God loving people, they're the type of people that reads Apostle Paul, who says, Christ came to die from, for sinners of whom I am the worst. They have a realistic picture of their life apart from the forgiveness of Jesus. And it fuels their worship. I share all these things because in today's text, we're in Luke chapter seven. And an immoral woman comes to pour herself out with all of her possessions in worship of Jesus. She is a Jesus lover. And it's because she's been forgiven much. On the contrast, there's this Pharisee, religious teacher who knows the law, knows every jot and knows every tittle. He knows about God a ton. And yet he misses out on just how good the presence of Jesus is in their midst. And it's because he is unaware of what he's been forgiven of. That is the unique difference between this woman and this man, between someone who misses out on the presence and goodness of Jesus because they know about him, but their intellect will not drop down 10, 12 inches to stir their affections for God. Church, we're gonna look at this passage. We're gonna read through it. And God desires us to grow up And stop being toddlers in the faith and be lovers of God. He wants intimates of his, of whom he tells secrets. And we'll see that in today's passage. Verse 36 of chapter 7. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. 
when a certain immoral woman from that city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. In God, who is our forgiver's presence, two people, the rule keeper and the rebellion. Let's see how they react in the presence of the the one who can forgive him. Verse 38, track with me here. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching her. She is a sinner. Then Jesus answered his thoughts. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. (laughs) Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Then Jesus told him this story. A man was loaned money, loaned money to two different people. The first one, 500 pieces of silver, and then to the other one, 50 pieces. But neither of them could repay him. So he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that, Jesus says. The Pharisee says, I suppose the one from whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, look at this woman kneeling here from my feet, but she's washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but you neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head. She's anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, though they are many, have been forgiven, washed away. So she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven shows little love, only little love. Jesus, the forgiver of sins in their midst, One person praises God with an unbridled groveling at his feet. The second one criticizes the worship of another. And the difference between those two happens to do with one person looking vertically and realizing their major offenses towards God and not comparing themselves to any other person. And that ends up being how she fuels her worship church. God desires to grow our love for him. It is the greatest command. Love the Lord our God with all of our heart, all our soul, and all our mind. This is our first and greatest commandment. And love our neighbors as ourself. The greatest thing that we could do, church, is to love God as he's loved us. And that's fueled best by a humility that sees our offenses towards God and thanks him all the more for his redemption. We're going to work through this passage, see what the Holy Spirit has for us. Let's pray. Jesus, I am grateful. Grateful for this immoral woman who we can look at, we can relate to God. And we ask that we would adopt her humility that we would have our affection stirred for you as we look back at what you have forgiven us of. I realize my limitations, but I know that when I am weak, you are strong, Jesus. Minister your word to your people. Grow us in godliness and affection for you. Help us enter into parts of our heart that are healed, in which we've asked you for forgiveness. And help us be aware where we have not asked for forgiveness. And would we bring that to your altar for your glory. You're a good, good God. In Jesus' name, we welcome you here this morning. Amen, amen, amen. Verse 36. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home, sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from that city heard that he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. 
So a first century Jewish context here, an alabaster jars would be the modern day equivalent of a perfume flask. The only difference is that uh, an alabaster jar didn't have a cap, so you would have to break that top, which had usually a long neck. What that meant was you were going to be hyper particular of when you break that to anoint anything. Because once you break that, there's no lid to put back on. And if this was nard, which is an oil, expensive oil back then, then it would cost her yearly wages for every pound. In other words, we see this woman come to Jesus and she worships at his feet with her most expensive possession. Church, this right here is a natural response when we experience the forgiveness of God. And I'm not talking about when we first get saved. I'm talking about every so often spiritually exercising by parsing out time and recalling what God has saved us from. And he will increase our love for him. It is a natural response to the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross for us to give all of our possessions to him. That's, it's American not to. It's cultural not to. To give all of our children to him to give all of our money to him, to advance his kingdom through every means that he's gifted from above as possessions. I wish, by God's grace, that we won't wait to the end of our lives in order to give up our most prized possessions, church. In order to give up climbing the social economic ladder in order to, and sacrificing all the while leading our family as Jesus did. I dream of a, a people who would practice the forgiveness of God, ruminate and think on what he's done for each and every one of us and that it would compel us to obedience because that's the natural response of his church. Look with me. Verse 38, we'll see exactly what she does with her possessions. Verse 38 here, then she knelt behind him at his feet weeping. Her tears fell on his feet. She wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. Jump down to verse 47 with me Why she did this. Jesus says, I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. The life of a God lover is made up of intimate moments with him. Can you read of her affection towards her forgiver in this? You don't know me before I came to know Jesus. And a lot of you, I thank God that you said, man, I, you, you must have just totally flipped the switch when you first got born again. You've known me 15 years of remembering Christ's forgiveness of my sins and it compelling me to turn away from sin and pursue him again. If you knew the things that I was forgiven of, it would make you uncomfortable. And I'm sure a lot of us in this room actually have that testimony. And it's a normal thing. We see it here in the text. It is a normal thing to show emotions as there's an overflow of love for what Jesus has forgiven us of. Jesus himself in a few places weeped and cried. In John 11, it tells us that he weeped out of compassion because his disciples Mary and Martha, they were mourning the loss of their brother Lazarus. And then in Hebrews 4, 5, it tells us that Jesus prayed with weeping on his last days and reverence to the Father. And that's actually the reason why the Father answered Jesus's prayers. Some of us have a background that are like mine. This will surprise a lot of you. My dad told me growing up, don't show emotions. 
He said, look at Barry Sanders. Model your, your football playing after him. After he scores, he just tosses it to him. It got so bad that when I was playing in the professional ranks, my coach paused the film and he said, Roy, you got to have fun sometimes. When I first got married to Danny, she came from a spirit-filled background of a local church here where expressing their love for God was normative as it is biblically and we see it everywhere, especially the Psalms. I was unfamiliar with it, and it made me uncomfortable. I loved God, but I was so uncomfortable in these musical settings because I felt emotions in my heart that were making me actually want to do something with my body that I skipped worship. This was 10, 11 years ago. Everyone has a story, and look where God's brought me. I get to facilitate an expressive church as we learn and we grow to fear God instead of what people think of us. Everyone's been on a journey and lovers of God. You're going to have moments to reflect back on during worship and during our interactive moments with the Holy Spirit as we leave here. And my exhortation is don't stifle those. When he reminds you of the abortion that you had and you asked him forgiveness and you were cleansed as white as snow. And he reminds you of when you said, but God, will you forgive me again? And he says, I don't even remember what you're talking about. That's just stir affections in our hearts. As he brings to mind all of the sensual things of stealing someone's you know what and giving to others and selfishly going around acting as a high school or college or before you got married, giving ourselves up to someone else who was never going to end up being our spouse. Allow God to remind you, if, if you've brought it to him, to praise him of how he's healed your heart. These are things that are normal in the kingdom of God. This outpouring of expression and thanksgiving, sometimes because y'all don't know me like that of my past, I thank God for the things that by faith I truly believe would have been true. I truly believe my family dynamic would have been different if I wasn't born again because of family patterns, because of selfish selfish attitude. My, My pops is born again now and praise God for that. I remember asking him, My third year in college, I was getting tired of waiting on the one. And I said, you know what? My disciple maker is going to tell me to just wait. And I'm like, I'm tired of that. So I asked my dad and I was like, I wonder what he's going to say. An unregenerate man by the spirit of God back then. I said, what do you think about, I'm interested in this person and this person. He says, why don't you date them both? I am very aware and each one of us are aware of the natural proclivities of sin that we have in our heart. And it is a normal thing to look back and thank God for what he saved us from, church. COB, as God continues to bring more and more people here, I just want everyone to know this is a place for you to express your love for Jesus. This is a place for you to grow in expressing your love for Jesus. Because we see here that this woman is caught up in a moment of rapture with Jesus. And she's showing unbridled, humiliating type of worship. I can't help but think that as she's at the foot of Jesus, she's remembering all the things that God's forgiven her of. All the times as church history teaches that she was a prostitute, which we doesn't say in the text, all the times that she was taken advantage of and God's healed her and forgiven her of. It is a normal thing, church, for us to motivate and fuel our love for God by remembering what he saved us from. And if we stifle those moments of thanking God for what he's forgiven us from, there's a caution here. Actually, the majority of the text is Jesus rebuking 
the Pharisee, the guy who knew a lot, and yet when it came time for his sins to potentially be forgiven, he's looking and he's judging by appearance the character of this woman and her form of worship. Let's look at it. There's going to be a caution here for us in the text. Long passages here. Verse 39. When the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She is a sinner. Then Jesus answered his thoughts. Love that. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Then Jesus told him this story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 to the other. But neither of them could repay him. So he kindly forgave them, both canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? Simon answered, I suppose the debt from whom he canceled the larger one. That's right, Jesus said. Then he returned, then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water, wash my feet. And she washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I first came in, she's not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil for my head, but she's appointed, she's anointed my feet with a rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, they are many, have been forgiven. So she's shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. I love it. The creator, sustainer, end of all things, and the forgiver of our sins is not embarrassed for this woman's form of worship because he knows her heart. It's an overflow of love. But what he does is he rebukes the pride in this Pharisee. And he does it three different times. He talks about different varying ways that she worshiped and poured out her being over Jesus, which were all hyper-culturally wrong and insensitive and humiliating to be in the presence of a man doing those things back then. And instead of taking in the presence of God and thanking him for just being there, he misses out on just how good God is. When we lack church in awareness for what God has forgiven us of, we will be tempted to fall into self-righteousness, to pride that blinds us, to looking down our nose at other people because they don't do certain things the way that we do, and to miss out on God's presence. The Pharisee doesn't see that his pride is an offense to God because he's comparing the woman who's been sleeping around in her offense to God. He doesn't realize that the posture of heart is something that motivates and informs what we do. And he is blind to the fact that Jesus can forgive him of his prideful heart. Because the default of each one of us when we're operating with ungratefulness as a byproduct of not recalling what Jesus for, has forgiven us of is we're going to be more harsh in judging others than we are of ourselves. Church, we have two options as we continue to grow in our love for God. Before that, number one, it is a beautiful thing to thank God for what he's forgiven us of. That's right. And the danger of not being overtly rebellious in your past, if you have a, a, a clean record, so to speak, and if you, were, you don't have that reckless testimony, is that you will be tempted to think that you never would have done those things. And you'll be tempted after you've gotten married to say, I never would have done those things. And you'll compare yourself to other people and how they continue to struggle. 
God has said in his word, my rule keeping friend, that everyone before we followed Jesus was an enemy of his. And that one sin made us culpable of being a guilty party and why Jesus had to descend, take on human form, live a perfect life in which we could not go to the cross so that anyone who would believe in him would be made right. Any type of sin makes us an enemy of God. So the exhortation is, may we no longer look left or to the right, but may we look to God's word, see his perfections of how he lived a perfect life despite sin depraved humanity and gave it for us and that we would have been guilty of crucifying him as well. Two types of people that we can choose to grow in church. The first one is just that we would be the person that would recall and ask God, would you give me an appreciation for what you saved me from? Though it may not be as long of a list compared to the Roy's of the world, help me feel a godly sorrow for departing from your love and stiff arming you for years. And secondly, church, is that we have an option if we withhold our posture of gratitude and the blessing and benefit of humbling ourselves and recalling what God has forgiven us of, then we'll fall into being a Pharisee. Jesus has called this church to not be a church of two classes, lovers of God and non-lovers of God. The greatest thing that he's given us to obey, everyone in the room, is to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, all of our soul, and all of our mind. That's incumbent on every single person here, if you're born again. We have um, Sikh nights, and um, they're a beautiful expression at this church that come every couple months. And um, I love what the Holy Spirit's doing in the congregation here. Um, he's growing people um, in this house and on seek nights to grow in our expressions of God. And he's brought along people who have for, been forgiven much. And when they get here on seek nights, the lid is blown off. And so last week it was beautiful. We just lingered in the presence of God, worshiped with song, had some prayer prompts. And there was a woman who's new to the church and she came dancing and she had a flag. Um, and I asked her to show up and I said, you need to be there at seek night because we need to be challenged as a church. We need to learn what it looks like to interact with God, the Holy spirit via these song lyrics, rather than putting our eyes down and focusing on what's happening with other people. And after I heard uh, grumblings of how it was a distraction and I thank God for that because each and every one of us, if we weren't distracted, we would be dishonor. We would be dishonest with ourselves. Whenever there's a new form of expressive worship here in this church, if you're not asking the question, well, what's going on there? We're not asking you to turn aside. We're asking you to thank God for the expressions of love in that person and believe the best that it truly is love being expressed Amen. and not looking down our noses at people who are dancing. And I have so much mercy on each and every one of everyone as we grow together in this, because you know my story. I was the guy who only came for the word being preached and look at what God has done. There's amazing things that he can remind us in this worship setting of what he saved us from. If we would so focus on him, Jesus, we thank you for your church. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your kindness. Blessed be your name. 
God, I thank you for the worship team that's coming up right now. I thank you for their stories. Each and every person in here is a trophy of your grace if we've surrendered to you. God, I thank you for this challenging word. And I ask that we would take the posture of the immoral woman, that we would humbly see our imperfections and what God has saved us from, what you've saved us to, what you've forgiven us from, and that we would worship you unbridled, unembarrassed for your glory, our goodness, and the building of faith in the saints. In Jesus' name, if we all agree, we said...